This evening's webinar is about food. And given that this is what is week, our intention this evening is to get a really clear sense of where we are in 2021 in terms of the current food system, and also to get a clear and inspiring taste of what's emerging, the green shoots of what comes next, very appropriate as we start coming into the spring. Where are we at? Are we deluding ourselves that anything other than the industrial food system can feed the world? Or are we seeing something emerging that represents the future system? And what has this past year of COVID taught us firstly about the fragility or otherwise of our current food system, but also about how rapidly systems can change when they have to? Our hope is that by the end of this evening, you'll have a clearer sense of where we are right now and what it tells us about the future. And so to our guests, our chefs, if you like, for this delicious feast we are about to sit down to. Julie Brown runs Growing Communities in Hackney, London, a social enterprise set up in 1996, working to transform food and farming through community-led trade. Growing Communities run a, a thriving community-led box scheme, an all-organic weekly farmer's market, a patchwork farm of urban market gardens in Hackney, Dagenham Farm in East London, and a training scheme for urban growers. They've helped set up 10 similar schemes, now known, now known collectively as Better Food Traders, and are looking to expand the network of the coming, over the coming three years, alongside setting up the Better Food Shed, a distribution hub consolidating supplies to London-based Better Food Traders. And I actually first met Julie learning to build straw bale houses sometime in the mid 90s. Uh, Tim Lang is Professor Emeritus of Food Policy at City University of London's Centre for Food Policy, which he founded and directed from 1994 to 2016. Hill farming in Lancashire in the 1970s formed his interest in the relationship between food, health, environment, culture and political economy. He writes a fair bit, is president of Garden Organic and sits on a few research advisory boards. He was the policy lead of the 2019 Eat Lancet Commission proposing the planetary diet. His most recent book, Feeding Britain, uh, exp explores the UK as a case study of a rich country's food system going awry. He proposes that the best route to food security is to put sustainability, health and social justice at its heart. D. Woods is a food and farming actionist who advocates for good food and all and good food for all and a just equitable food system challenging the systemic barriers that impact marginalized communities and food producers. Dee's work sits at the nexus of food and farming, particularly in intersectionality, diversity, equity and anti-oppression, decolonization, reparations, the right to food and nutrition, participatory policy making, community food systems, food system change, food commons, agroecology and food sovereignty. And Pam Warhurst co-founded Incredible Edible. And we've already seen some incredible edible groups with us this evening. An initiative begun in Northern England, dedicated to growing food locally by planting on unused land throughout the community. She called it propaganda gardening. Pam has been an activist and advisor for over 40 years, involved in local politics and national policy as the chair of the board of the Forestry Commission, which advises on and implements forestry policy in Great Britain. She also co-founded Incredible Edible Todmorden, a local food partnership that encourages community engagement through local growing. Incredible Edible started small with the planting of a few community herb gardens in Todmorden and today has spin-offs in the US and Japan, counting over 150 groups in the UK and a thousand worldwide. Incredible Edible empowers ordinary people to take control of their communities through active civic engagement, redefining prosperity through the power of small actions. Today Pam chairs Incredible Edible, supporting and amplifying the work of groups around the UK. She also chairs Pennine Prospects, which works with local authorities, government agencies, businesses and voluntary organisations and the local community to create the South Pennines Park, the first socially purposed park in the country. She's currently developing the impact work of Incredible Edible through the proposition of a new social contract to transform the frameworks of our lives so that all people can live well and live long. 
Pam also works as part of the global network of social entrepreneurs as an Ashoka Fellow. Wow, welcome all. So delighted you could be here with us. So the format for this evening is that each of you are going to have around 10 minutes to share your thoughts. And I really invite you to bring your most punctual selves uh, this evening. So Tim, I'd love to start with you, if I may. Your new book, Feeding Britain, does an incredible job of setting out where we're at in 2021 with our food system, its state of health and its vulnerabilities. So let's start with you. Could you share with us what you seeing as being the what you see as being the current state of play, how COVID has impacted that, and what it's shown us about our current food system, what you seeing as being our what you see as being our current trajectory, and also where you see the green shoots of something different of what comes next. Over to you, Tim. Thanks very much, Rob, and uh, thanks for inviting um, well us all, and thanks everyone for coming. Um, the three questions Rob just threw at me then are immense. Um, they're not easy to answer. And thinking about this evening, I actually just put down some thoughts, which I'll come to in a moment. But you, you refer to my book, which I didn't particularly want to talk about, but it, it basically does look at Britain. I mean, I'm a, an internationalist. I, I voted to stay in the European Union, I, not because I have any fantasies about it. I spent most of my 45 years uh, in it and against it, criticizing it, pushing it, shoving it. But I ultimately think, um, a great poet put it, no man is an island. And we know in food, no, the, 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 the dream of me, 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 me just looking after myself is not the way to deal with the world's problems. Um, and you, this is billed as being about what's the state of alternative food movements. Uh, we shouldn't ask that to an academic, uh, even if he was a farmer and still is very active. Um, but I've had a go at putting some thoughts down and where are they? They're here. You should be able to all see that, I hope. Now, can you all see that? No. Can, Rob, can you put your hand up? Just say yes or no. Yeah, good. Okay, you got it. Okay, I sat down. I could give you a very long version of this, but I won't. Um, in my book, I wasn't talking about the alternative food movement. I was looking at the state of our country, my country, Britain, uh, not through the lens of, you know, um, a little Englander or indeed some naive globalist, but I'm just saying we now know an awful lot about what the food system is, what it does, who's winning, who's losing. And essentially, if we look at Britain, which when I started to write my book was the fifth richest economy in the world, it's now the sixth. We're on a sliding scale down. We're a post-imperial country that thinks it's imperial still and can get others to feed us. We've had about 40% of our food from the European Union. What are we doing? Well, the answer is we still don't know. We're in an extraordinary situation at the moment. But within that, the alternative food movement in Britain is in a really interesting place. Uh, compared to certainly when I started 45 years ago with a gang of friends started thinking about Britain, the debate then was all of the third world, as it was called, the developing nations. Britain was perfect. The problem was the developing world. And some of us began to think, no, it isn't. Actually, we're part of the problem. We've got the power. We've got the capital. We've got the big food companies. We've got the great sucking sound using other people's land and labor, but not doing our own particularly well. So I've spent the last 45 years of my life trying to think about this. What are we doing? How are we doing it? Trying to help build it. And my view is these five points. I think we've come a long way in the last 50 years. We're winning arguments, but we're not achieving big change. Don't let fantasize that we are. We're not. It's not big enough. Even as we made big gains, which are fantastic uh, and greatly to be celebrated, the power uh, that big corporations have uh, and a way of thinking has over the food system kind of goes three steps faster than we go. Um, I'm not a pessimist, but I'm just trying to be realistic. I think we've come a long way. We're winning arguments, 
but we're not achieving really the big systemic change that many of us think is necessary. The second point is we have got a huge credit when Rob phoned me or wrote to me or whatever he did or texted me and said this and said, you know, the other three on this um, session were going to be on it. I said, well, of course I'll come. I'd love to be. These are people I hugely um, admire and support. Um, we've got just wonderful, what I call democratic experimentation going on. Incredible, edible, Julie Browns and, uh, uh, you know, the Hackney community systems, shorter food systems rather than the long ones, um, local rather than the big global, um, uh, land-based rather than just me, 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 whatever I want, strawberries all the year round, wherever from, etc. There's wonderful democratic experimentation, lots bubbling up, as I put, but I don't think we're coordinated enough to drive big wedges into normality. Third point, uh, I'm a social scientist by training. Um, for me, I've spent a lot of my life looking up at the power. Um, food power is consolidating in a quite astonishing way. In the last 15 years, just to give an example, the new home delivery service, the Deliveroo's, the Uber Eats, the Just, et cetera, they have emerged from nowhere, nowhere, and in 15 years are making as much money as farming is, and indeed more in some respects. Um, uh, and, and so just when we think maybe we can get a bit of a grip over the food system, another um, uh, chain is, is inserted into an already long chain to make it longer. And the general rule that more money and power is off the land than on the land, that's even more acute. At present, for example, Britain spends about £225 billion a year on food and, and soft drinks, and about £9 billion goes to primary producers. The value added is about 7%. Uh, going to primary producers. They're squeezed, basically. And that's a rule everywhere in the world. Uh, um, the primary producers get next to very little, not nothing, of uh, what uh, one might expect they would get. It's internationalizing this uh, food power, and it's footloose, as I put. There is no taxing. Amazon this week has launched its first no checkout. Um, shop in Britain, um, you know, look at the tax structures, uh, the way in which international food companies can basically offset and move around, you know, there's big money being made from food and not much getting back to primary producers, but a lot of money going into software manufacturers. Uh, four, we have got, as Rob said, Brexit and COVID, an astonishing juxtaposition, but actually not astonishing. Um, which requires a lot of cool heads from the alternative food movement. Um, where I think the advantage lies is where the food system goes from this everywhere, but in Britain particularly, is uncertain. We still have no national food policy in England. Scotland, Wales, a little bit in Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales have got very interesting, but in, inadequate in, in most terms, but very interesting, both movements and, and policies and policy frameworks and initiatives. Um, but in England, there's nothing. We have no national food policy in England. Uh, where that goes, that is actually an opportunity for something like this, Rob, to come together at the end of the three weeks and say, what are our demands? The Dimbleby, Henry Dimbleby, a decent man, uh, 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 heading the National Food Strategy. It's been put back again, I understand most recently this week, I was briefed on it. It's now coming out in July, you know, so here we are five years from referendum and we still don't know what's replacing where we're going. We know what the common agricultural policy is not going to be. And basically if you look at that, the subsidies are maintained for about three more years and then they tail down and you'll only get paid as a primary producer, a farmer, um, for ecosystem support. That sounds great. You know, a lot of the conservation organizations say, whoopee, that's what we want. Really? So food is not part of what we want from land? Tell that to Julie Brown. I want to hear what she thinks about that. 
And underpinning all of this very sober assessment that Rob asked me to give me, what do I think the state of alternative food movement is, is this hard and growing evidence of the huge challenges on us for food, not just the eco, the climate change, food's the biggest driver of climate change that a consumer can make. Uh, and you notice in the, in the budget, not even anything about the greening issues, well, a little bit about green infrastructure, but you know, biodiversity loss, the, the embedded water that is being sucked into Britain in the form of uh, other people's land and water, the society and inequalities, the jobs, the skills, the, the, the norms of culture. We have dented a little bit. I think we've made most gains there, but on governance, decision-making, we're not making very much uh, at all. But I'm someone, and I think like most people on this call, who think we have to put much more effort at the city and sub-national level at the local, and I want to hear what Pam and Dee have to say about that, because I'm with them on that. So to, to summarize, I'm fairly sober, but that said, I'm incredibly optimistic, despite the evidence, as I always say. Uh, the evidence is not good. The evidence, in fact, is terrible. Uh, if you look at, uh, you know, the UN Secretary General this week has just said the rich countries who are supposed to have been doing lots of things just on the issue of climate change to bring towards the Paris climate change commitments. Um, actually, when you look at re in reality what their climate change emissions are down, they're only down about 1%, when they should be getting towards the 20, 25% by 2030. But in food, we can make a very big change in CO2 emissions and water use and biodiversity and social inequalities and jobs and skills and changing culture if we move very fast there. So I think food is a really ripe issue. Uh, uh, and uh, well, I could say a little bit more, but let's leave it for later. So it's really important to have discussions like we're having tonight. And I wrote down, you know, educate, organize, intervene, experiment, learn, develop, et cetera, et cetera, all the things you're all doing and we're doing. But the critical thing is I don't think we're winning public hearts and minds enough. Uh, the default is still 30% of the British public feed themselves at Tesco. Uh, and fair enough, you know, but that's, and COVID by the way, has been bonanza for five retailers government closed down hospitality where you had some alternative food networks moving in to, uh, to the, the small and medium sized enterprise um, uh, uh, area of the economy and they've just been smashed, completely smashed and smashed down. But they're still there, some of them are waiting to bubble up. Um, so I think we have an immensely important opportunity to win hearts and minds. And at the moment, the big uh, politics is not doing it. If you want to see what I've said in one slide, and Rob referred to my book, Feeding Britain, this is the sort of policy analysis on which I, I, I base my thinking. And the fifth of my book is about the way forward, by the way. It's not just, you know, let's have more... Uh, incredible edible or, 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 or transition towns. Of course, those are incredibly important and I salute those. Um, but really, we've got to think bigger. This is a major crisis upon us and it's not getting major rethinks. And yet the alternative food movement is where I think the big thinking is going on. And for me, if I have six words to say, if I get asked by a policymaker, what do I think we need? Well, it's this in the middle, sustainable diets from sustainable food systems. You've got a lot of people saying, well, let's take a bit of plastic off our wrapping of our food before it goes down a long chain, but it's not changing diets. And look what COVID has taught us, the catastrophic impact of, 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 of disruption has put more people into food poverty and it was already in a really bad place, but at the same time, the absurd levels of uh, obesity we have in Britain. Now, the huge report from the World Obesity Federation done by my ex-colleague, Tim Lobstein, um, a brilliant report, uh, just showing how worldwide, but in Britain in particularly harrowingly bad, worldwide, uh, it's not just BMA, AME, a, a low income, it's an obesity and diet impacted disease. So we've got a very, very 
clear message to make to the public. Sustainable diets from sustainable food systems. That means all of us change what is eaten and what we demand from the land and where the jobs are and so on. I think I've said enough, Rob, so I'll stop there. Tim, thank you so much. Wonderful. Well, what, you know, wonderful. I mean, like uh, uh, wonderfully, wonderfully put. <laughs> thank you so much, as always. So, uh, Dee, let's let's turn to you next. Based on the work that you do, working with communities in London, creating new food systems, might you share with us something about what you do, and also your sense of what's most exciting to you in terms of the things that you see already unfolding and growing in the UK? What's the current state of health of the construction? of what comes next and on what foundations does that need to be built? Dee, over to you. Okay, how do I follow Tim? Um, the thing is, communities right now are in a really bad state. You know, we're the ones taking on the responsibility of government to ensure that people have access to food and their rights the human right to food and nutrition. And we're expected to come up with the solutions as, as well. I think most of us on the ground, for want of a be better term, you know, we have to think, we have to come up with those solutions. Um, so I co-founded and sort of co-run Grandel Community Kitchen in Northwest London. It's an area for over a hundred years that has experienced sort of, you know, multiple indices of deprivation. And as a community, we are saying no more. Um, we are pushing back um, against authority, against you know, all these systemic issues of racism, um, all, all the impacts of health disparities, you name it, we are pushing back because you know what? We have a right to live in dignity. We have a right to experience good health. We have a right for our children to breathe clean, clean air. And we, we see it all as being interconnected. So good food systems for myself and for a lot of other people that I work with start with people at the center. It starts with the most marginalized at the center. We might be on margins, we might be on edges, but we're placing ourselves at the center as people of color, as disabled people, as poor people, you name it, as women, as queer people, we're at the center. And I think it was yesterday I saw on Instagram this wonderful definition of what queering is. So not just related to gender and sex, but as deconstructing and subverting and questioning and challenging all the normative ideas and all those structures of power. And that's exactly what we're doing. As ordinary people who a few years ago didn't know anything about any of the, those processes from the local to the international, that is what we're doing. So at Granville Community Kitchen, we've started a good food box, working with Better Food Traders, working with Land Workers Alliance and um, farmers in Southwest, but also recognizing we're a global community and that we have to work at the global sphere. So working with the African and Caribbean Heritage Food Network, which was an organization I co-founded with fellow food board member Kemi Atajazan last year because we saw that gap. There was a gap in terms of advocacy for our foods, for our foodways. Um, and we're feeling the impacts of that. We've felt the impacts of, you know, the pandemic on our communities. And now with Brexit, it is even worse with no sort of country, third country agreements, 
um, with all those tariffs on, on our, you know, culturally appropriate foods, um, making our food impossible to buy. Um, you know, it's like, I don't know if people know about breadfruits. So one breadfruit is about 12 pounds. I mean, how can you feed a family if you're buying one item that costs 12 pounds? So of course you are going to eat the foods that are cheap. And those are the foods that proliferate in our communities. The cheap, highly processed foods from the supermarkets, you know, and all, all these, as I said, all these things interconnect. So that's why we have health issues. That's why we have obesity. We live in poor housing. All these things are planning issues, they're policy issues, and which is why we need to be in those spaces and which is why ordinary people need to be more active in those spaces. So we're working on building the capacity of people to say to, the, to our local councillors, no, all right, we will not accept that. We want, as we're terming it now, good food retail. And we want to help shape that, be it a market, be it a shop front, be it whatever. No one should have to travel halfway across London just to get their culturally appropriate food. So at Granville Community Kitchen, as I said, so we've started what we call this radical solidarity veg box scheme. Um, it has two tiers for now um, so that low income people can actually access organic food and culturally appropriate food. Um, and those who can afford more, they pay more, they pay in higher price, but they also have the option to pay into what we call a solidarity investment fund. So we're building up a little kitty, all right, to be able to afford more of that expensive food. Um, we're also seeking to grow more food ourselves. And a lot of culturally appropriate foods can be grown here. And it's just a matter of education, as Tim said. Um, it's a matter of access to land um, and, and scaling up and scaling across so that we can feed our communities. And in sort of seeking that, so uh, what I call black food sovereignty, we will be supporting everyone else in terms of accessing food. Um, so that's some work I'm also doing with the Land Workers Alliance right now in terms of developing community food resilience. Um, I'm working with farmers up and down the country in terms of putting people and putting social justice at the heart of their farming so that we are working with people and people who need that, that food the most. Um, I could go on forever, but I want to hear what Julie has to say, I want to hear what Pam has to say, and then I look forward to a wonderful discussion, because I know I could talk, yeah, for everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. There was uh, somebody just asked, what's the difference between an activist and an actionist? Describe yourself. Um, so actionist, the actionist term came from my late mentor, Wayne Roberts, uh, who died recently, um, Canadian godfather of food policy councils. And he always said, actionists are people who just get on and do it. And that's what I've always done. You know, no money, I just get on and do it because I know that money will come. I know that people will come. And I think that's how we build movements. We just need to do it. And, you know, and do it in a way that we need leave nobody behind. Do it in a way where we're not replicating those structures of, of harm. You know, so building things and ecology of community care. All right, Dee, that's, that's my headspace right now. <laughs> yeah. Dee, wonderful. Thank you so much. Great stuff. Julie, over to you now. So for, the, for many years, you've been working in Hackney with growing communities to build the next system. 
your work of creating new intensive food gardens within London and of creating connections between urban communities and peri-urban food producers is so inspiring. It'd be great to hear your thoughts on what's the state of health of the alternative right now? What are the emerging projects and initiatives that most give you hope? And what, what do they need to be mindful of and to bear in mind? And what would help them to scale up? Julie, over to you. Um, okay, thank you, Rob. Um, I'm just gonna work out how I'm gonna share the screen. Um, go over here. I'll get there, hang on, sorry. Is that sharing? Not quite yet. So down the bottom, there is a share screen button. That's it. Yeah, you're good. Great, thank goodness, got over the first tech hurdle. I'm the only, I'm the only one that seems to have done PowerPoint. So it, this could be another example of death by PowerPoint coming up, but anyway, let's see how we go. Um, so uh, thanks for inviting me to speak. And it's so nice to see Tim and Dee, um, and you of course, Rob and Pam, I don't know if you remember, we actually spoke at a transition uh, event many years back now, and we had five minutes to do a pitch. And I remember that we both just spoke really, 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 really fast. Um, I have a sneaky feeling I'm going to do that exactly the same today. So here we are, whistle-stop tour of what we do, principles underpinning it. And then I'm going to finish and look at what's going on at the moment on the ground now. Okay, so, so uh, this is us. Um, I mean, you actually said quite a lot of this in the intro, Rob, so maybe I can really skip through this. This is us. We work in Hackney, based in Hackney since 1996, staff, 32 staff, annual turnover around 2.5k, just to give you a sort of an idea of the sort of scale of, that, that we're working at. Um, our, aims, our aims are to build a fairer and more sustainable food system that looks after people, the soil and the planet, and... Uh, we do that by providing farmer focused routes to market that work for the organic and the small scale producers that we believe should be the foundation of such a system. So uh, we do that through a box scheme and a farmer's market, as Rob mentioned. Uh, the box schemes serves 1,400 customers a week, the farmer's market 1,500 customers a week. Uh, we work with 30 sustainable farmers and processors, and um, I think that the last time we tried to wangle out this bit of information, we were supplying around 4% of the fresh veg in Hackney. Um, what else? Oh, affordability and accessibility. So um, uh, uh, our prices, our prices are generally less expensive than supermarket organic, but they are definitely not as cheap as the Panda Bowl shops. Um, we do a few other things. We have uncollected or leftover produce goes to community partners, including several homeless and refugee projects. Um, and we have a scheme called a free credit scheme. So when um, members, uh, members take a holiday from the veg scheme, they can donate the value of their bags to the food credit scheme. And then we arrange for a selection of uh, fresh organic produce to go to the local food bank. Uh, we have a pensioners discount and we accept healthy start vouchers. Although to be honest, the uptake of healthy start is really, really low. And that's one of the reasons why we're also looking to set up a more affordable or a fair food or a solidarity option next year. So ideally we want to link that to a research project to evaluate the kind of how much the subsidy is worth in terms of health gains and other public goods. Um, and we're working through the details of that now. And I'm actually keen to hear more from Dee about the solidarity mm -hmm. bag and how that's working at Granville Community Gardens. So that'd be really great later. Um, we do some of our own food growing um, on uh, nine small sites in Hackney called the Patchwork Farm and we also have a larger farm in Dagenham where it's, a, uh, it's two acres mainly largely covered growing space and we run trainee programs and outreach programs on them all a bit curtailed through uh, through the pandemic which nobody's has anybody mentioned that no anyway sorry um, <laughs> sorry it's taking me totally off the pandemic six tons of, of salad and veg we grew last week I mean not last week last year sorry that would be really intensive um so um we also helped to launch a startup program back in 2010 and we now have 11 or so uh trading groups that we helped to set up similar projects they've now uh grown into what is called the better food traders network um and the better food traders network is now expanding its membership as well so this is basically a network of uh of food traders who are trade mainly fresh fruit and veg um, produced from mainly organic and agroecological farmers um, and the aim is to be a mutually supportive and expanding network um, so it's looking for more retailers if you think you fit the bill then hopefully the, 
the link will be in the chat. Um, uh, yeah, so the aim is to to help basically these food traders tell their story and basically get more increased demand for their produce and their services. Um, we also last year set up the Better Food Shed. Um, so this is a wholesaling club operation. It's probably more better described as a collaborative distributor. We wanted to do two main things. We wanted to reduce the journeys and aggregate the produce from the small farmers who were now delivering to multiple better food traders in London, operating in the London area. And we wanted to achieve enough buying power um, to basically enable us to access some of the larger scale growers who otherwise we'd only been able to get to via a wholesaler. Um, and then what else? Uh, I think probably after sort of, a, Oh God, it's a couple of decades working on the ground now. We're now mm -hmm. looking more at how to work, you know, more actively in the policy and advocacy sphere. So we're on the Fruit and Veg Alliance, on the Horticulture Roundtable, which we have very awkward discussions with DEFRA. Um, uh, we input it into the National Food Strategy, which is kind of ongoing. And we're also actively involved in um, the environmental land management schemes of tests and trials, which is basically the the system that's in, going to replace the common agricultural policy or is it who knows i mean what's going on um we uh we work with a whole range of groups sustain the land workers alliance soil association food foundation so um that's kind of what we do um in terms of our underlying kind of principles um i think it's fair to say that most of us in the city particularly in the cities where most of us live are massively disengaged from how our food is produced and from the people that do this work, most important work, and we just don't see farmers. Um, so anyway, here, here, some of our farmers are there. So um, we've recently started using the term farmer focus to try to describe the way we work with them and the routes to market we provide. So it's, there's two sort of main, there's lots of different elements to it, but the two main ideas are firstly, we want to make sure that organic and agroecological farmers, that those that we trade with get more, or in fact, most of the money in the supply chain. Farmers receive around 9% of the customer pound and Tim was actually mentioning six, so it's even less. And then maybe that's the international figure. Anyway, 9% of the customer pound in the, in the supermarket driven system, while in our system, they receive 56% or more of the customer pound. And I mean, the other way of looking at this is something we called follow the potato. Um, eagle-eyed of you will notice that is actually kale. No questions, please, or we can discuss that. This is Martin, who grows quite a lot of our potatoes. Um, so uh, we pay at least 80p a kilogram for those potatoes, while the farm gate price is 15p a kilogram. So we pay Martin for his potatoes so that uh, he can farm them ecologically and can pay his farmers a pair, a, 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 his workers fairly. Um, we're also paying him for the public goods such as biodiversity and climate mitigation that he provides and that the current system fails to reward him for. And we're also compensating for the fact that those 15 P potatoes, potatoes, do not reflect the true cost, the true cost of producing them. So the costs such as nitrogen pollution and soil degradation. Um, so, I mean, the bottom line for us is that if we want more climate and friendly uh, food production, we have to provide farmers with more of the money in the supply chain to enable them to do that. So the other element of farmer focused is, um, is that uh, we try very hard as retailers to help our customers and members to eat seasonally and that's how we source and to make the most of what our farmers are best able to produce at any particular time of the year. We, we, we work to help customers see that and members as the core of their weekly shop. So this is in the spirit of something um, that the farmer author James Rebank said quite recently, which is that our diets, our diets should be shaped by what works for the land. Um, and we work very hard to help our customers appreciate this approach, or better still, to see the creative potential of working within the limits that seasonality imposes on shopping and eating habits. Um, I mean, we also try to take a balanced approach too. So while all the farmers we trade with are certified organic, as we think this is the best externally validated proxy for climate and nature friendly production, not everything we trade is local. Our approach to trade is represented by a diagram we call the food zones. Um, um, so, uh, so this is our vision of what a sustainable food and farming system might look like, and it emerged back in 2008. 
um, after we spent a decade or so working on practical projects on the ground. And what the food zones does is it looks at how much of which kinds of foods we could be raising uh, from where, starting close to us as possible and working out, raising what it makes most sense to, to grow, taking into account, oops, I realise my, my, my PowerPoint isn't doing anything. Look, oh, look, 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 amazing. Taking into account all of the factors shown and then on the right, it looks at what, what kind of farms we're looking at, uh, what a sustainable diet might look like, the trading systems we need, the principles that underpin it and the world views. Um, so that's, not, that, that's our vision of a, a sustainable uh, food system. Most of the food we trade actually comes from our rural hinterland, Kent, Essex, Norfolk. And we do some wholesaling, particularly, as I said, in the, hunt, you know, in the hungry gap um, and to buy the odd winter trait to, to help us get through the wonderful seasonal offerings of brassicas and roots, but you know, sometimes you need something a little bit better. I mean, not better, Ooh, a little bit different from that to get you through. So that's the vision. Um, and I love the way that Rob has described uh, the food zones in the past as a call to be creative. I think that's the short version of how you've described it more eloquently than me at that point. So, but, so what I thought I'd end with is what has actually happened in practice. So. Um, if we zoomed into Hackney itself, I mean, along with the GC uh, Patchwork Farm, which operates on nine far, you know, which operates on nine small sites, we have Hackney City Farm, where we have one of our collection points for the box scheme. We have E5 Bakery, where we also have an, a, a collection point for the box scheme. We have the Luminary Bakery. Uh, we have the Better Health Bakery. Um, the Better Health Bakery uh, has a stall at our farmer's market. We have Dalston Eason Curb, which is this beautiful oasis down in Dalston. I mean, live the dream. But actually, Dalston has turned out to be that, which is shocking. That's something that ha has actually really changed over the, the last uh, couple of, you know, the last 10 years. Um, we have what else? We have Setopia Garden in Hackney. We have Hackney Herbals. We do amazing things with herbs. Uh, we have St Mary's Secret Garden. Um, we have Cordwainers. Uh, we have the Castle Garden, which is a garden that you know that grows food for the cafe and the climbing centre. We have da Dabber Drop, which is an ethical takeaway, and we have Maiden Hackney, who basically do cookery courses, vegan cookery courses for disadvantaged or economically challenged communities who have pivoted at the beginning of the pandemic to, to basically be providing, you know, uh, uh, free, uh, ready meals. Um, and then last but not least, we have Get Loose, which is an unpackaged project that's actually based at Hackney City Farm. And uh, uh, Jackie, who runs it, used to be one of, you know, used to work at our farmer's market. So um, so that's just a fraction of what goes on. And I mean, don't even get me started on the brewers um, uh, and, and the beards. Anyway, that's a, another matter entirely. Um, so. So if we looked at the peri-urban zone, what we've got, we've got grown communities, uh, Dagenham Farm which we've mentioned. We've also got Hawkwood, which is organically. We've got 40 whole farm market garden. We've got Wolves Lane. We've got Cultivate London. We've got Sutton Community Farm. We've got Keeps Community Farm. And the latest one is that coming up is Setopia Farm in Greenwich. And um, so uh, this is where Setopia is gonna be. Um, and uh, there's, there's, there's the link, link to the, um, what's it called? The crowd funder, which would be brilliant to, to give that a, a bit of a plug. Um, this, this farm is being set up by Chloe, who used to be a trainee of ours. She then went off to set her own site in Hackney, and now she's doing this. So there's so many connections. And I'm, I'm proud to say, uh, to think that we have helped inspire some of these projects and businesses. And I know that many of them have inspired us too. So, I mean, for us, the R urban growing is, is kind of, it's, it's how we grow, not just growers, but, uh, but uh, food activists who spread like, um, I can't, I, I don't know why I put this word in, I can't say it anyway, mycorrhizal fungus through the soil and then they pop up in a whole new place and do amazing stuff. Um, and the other thing is to say, uh, you know, growing communities is like Hotel California. I mean, you can check out, but you can never leave. Every, there's kind of links all over the place. Um, so um, last but not least, I would like to come back to um, 
the counties around London, which is where we have our rural farmers who provide the foundation of our system and to whom we are incredibly grateful. I mention them now again because it's easy to get carried away by the excitement of urban growing. But the bulk of what we eat comes from our rural hinterland and it's vital that we build connections and equitable trading relationships with the farmers there, showing them appreciation and paying them fairly for the work they do. Um, Fortunately, a recent report that we did that, that, that the New Economics Foundation and the Soil Association did on, on the growing communities model concluded that we are indeed managing to do that, and I quote, by utilising short supply chains and working in partnership with farmers, growing communities are able to redistribute economic power to farmers, providing them with financial security to generate considerable social value for themselves and even greater benefits for the environment. So it can be done. Um, we just need more of it. We just need much, 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 much. How long have I got? Much more of it. Um, hopefully some of you, hopefully some of you listening tonight will be inspired to jump in or in fact to take what you were already doing to the next level. So I'm just going to leave it there. So thanks for listening. I don't know how long I did on the time. Julie, you're <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. What, what an inspiration. I, it was a lovely slip. Of the, I couldn't tell if it was a slip of the tongue or not when you said, uh, don't get me started on the brewers and the beards. And then whether you meant to say beers or actually whether they're actually were referring to the beards that often accompany craft brewers. It wasn't a slip. It was <laughs> mentioning beards. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. So always so inspirational to, to hear the work you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. So last but absolutely by no means least, uh, Pam Warhurst. So Pam has the most incredible brain, always looking for smart new ways to scale up innovative new food ideas and to make partnerships in brilliant and unexpected ways. So Pam, we'd love to hear your thoughts in terms of how far the incredible edible idea has come since it first occurred to you and other Todd and folks, what your sense is of the blockages and obstacles to this stuff really scaling up, how transformative such a new food and system could be, and where else you see the inspiring shoots of possibility. Pam, over to you. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's all a bit scary, this, because I haven't got any master plan, basically. Um, and I think Tim set us off with, uh, this is one hell of a big gig. And um, all that I can do is offer um, observations from an experiment that's been going on for 13 years. And before I get into that, so where we're going with it and the unusual connections we've made with people that have given me some confidence that this is the absolute moment to grab and to be brave and bold and connect um, across all the stuff that we're doing wherever we can. It's just to say, I've been so impressed. Uh, you know, Julie, the stuff you're doing about critical mass around place is absolutely incredibly important because theories tend to be disparate Practical action is focused and concentrated around place. And that is where you can actually start to have things to point at and say, this is what good looks like. Come on, let's do more of this. So I loved all that. And Dee, I absolutely loved what you were saying about investing in people's self-worth, their confidence, their ability to articulate what it is they want and why they want it and why the rest of the people who are in their way should get out of it. So I love both of those. And there's a little bit of that in, in what I have to say, but um, I guess it's as David Coleman for the people that are old enough in this audience, and there's not that many of you says, it's a game of two halves. So the first half was kind of thinking, all right, what are we gonna do about this? I, you know, I sat in London, Tim will know this. I always start by saying this, but I've only got eight minutes or something. So I'm not gonna say very much of it. And he was banging on about the stuff that you've been banging on about tonight. But, you know, and you're thinking, oh, my God, this is absolutely terrible. What are we going to do, particularly with respect to use of red meat and particularly with respect to overuse of uh, resources on the planet? And that was when Incredible Edible popped into my mind. And that was why it came complete. Its birth was completely complete, which was about, OK, I have no idea how we're going to do this, but I'm damn sure we can't do it without people. And I'm sure we can't do it without trusting people to do the right thing if they're in a system that actually helps them do it. So where are we going to start? So, you know, doing this train journey, made up this idea of Incredible Edible, told Mary, my mate in Todmorden, shall we have a crack at doing this, uh, town of 14,000 people, and we did. And the model is really straightforward. It says, 
if we're actually going to help people to live well and prosper on this planet, and these are the people that aren't reading The Guardian, these are the people who give a damn about their kids but have the foggiest idea about where to start in life if they're actually going to build something that is really great to wake up in the morning to do. If we're going to do that, what's language we're going to use? We're going to use food. Because people get food, people are connected with food across age, income, culture and ability. So that is why it is food. But actually, what's been really great is that it was food. And that's why we're having this conversation today. The model was really simple. It said, right, you've got to do three things. Wait, if you really give a damn about tomorrow and you really know that you're, you're, you're not a victim, but you're part of a solution, if only people would listen to what you had to say, why don't we crack on doing three things? Why don't we just grow food all over the place we call home? With or without permission, it doesn't make any difference. Why don't we put signs up there to say, this is food to share. This is what a Brussels sprout looks like. Have you tasted what this parcel is about? Have you ever seen tomatoes like this growing in the middle of a tent? Whatever it might be. That idea of bringing our gifts to food in public places and occasionally private, but on the whole, we asked people in private gardens if we could grow. If we actually did that, we created the things that Rob was talking about, propaganda gardens, and that created a buzz. And it was, it was the fastest way to market, quite honestly, for people to be able to change the look and the spaces and the feel of their lives on their streets, in those unloved corners, wherever they might be. And along the way, meet new people, have a great crack and start to feel, you know, I've got some traction around here. The, the second play was once you're doing all that, you've just got to remember that nobody teaches our kids how to cook. So why would anybody want to grow? You know, I mean, People in my town don't know how to peel a spud. Let's get a grip about this. So fundamentally, what do we know? We know there's loads of people out there who, who do know how to do things and bottle and preserve and graft a tree. Just nobody ever bothers asking them. And most of them are retired. You know, the best people to tell me what to do with potatoes were the retired miners in Wigan. It's, so we start those conversations about the lost arts and we have those, you know, chats and we exchange skills and it's not top down and we didn't go to the lottery for some money in the first place. It's a killer when you ask people for money, they tell people you what to do with it, for goodness sake. So I know we need money at some point, not dissing money. I'm just saying it is a little restrictive. And the third element of it is there's got to be jobs in this. There's got to be local food jobs. There's got to be pride in being the next generation of a farmer, an urban farmer or whatever it is. You've got to be able to think in the morning, I can get up, I've got a great street stall, I'm going to sell fantastic food. I'm going to learn how to do more. So the third element was if you've got a pound in your pocket, spend it on something local. Go to a local market store. If you've not got a pound in your pocket, that's absolutely fine. But if you have, don't automatically go to Morrison's, Tesco's or whatever. Think a minute. Support your local cheese store. And then collectively, all you've done is to find sustainable development. But you've not talked about sustainable development. You've just thought about food and sharing it and meeting people and learning new skills and having a better life. So that's great, that's the model and it's dead simple and it's all about storytelling and 150 groups all over the shop in the UK kicked off and doing that. And you know, post COVID, of course, you know, we have got some real challenges around that. But what is really great, the stories that people are telling is those people that were grown, that had confidence, because it's about growing confidence, not just food. In those communities, they were showing leadership in terms of how to help those less advantaged eat well in difficult times. They were ahead of the game in terms of building resilience in their town. And before COVID, we had floods in Tobin. So we've had lots of experience about dealing with everyday stuff like that, where you need to think fast on the spot. And it's only people on the spot that can come up with radical solutions and create great outcomes with not a right lot of money. That's happened all over the world. We're talking to people in Australia and it's, it's fantastic. Why? Because it's dead simple because people are fed up of waiting for other people to come up with a solution. And because we each and every one of us want to invest in our families and our communities so they can live well and prosper. And we've got the gun to our head, which in one way is a terrible thing to say is the best card we've got, which is climate change. Because this is not time for procrastination and writing another thesis. This is time for action and uniting and collaborating. So to pick up Tim's point, how are we actually going to do that? Well, all I can tell you is what our, our experiment is about. It's about helping groups find their own governance structure. So it's not about somebody on high doing this top down stuff about wouldn't it be great if we did this stuff, but actually sharing stories 
and, and communicating in ways that inspire each other and growing the movement at a grassroots level. Absolutely fine. Not an easy thing to do. A lot of people talk about it, but there are big problems along the way. But that is an absolute primary given of what we need to be able to do because without people on the ground doing this stuff it don't mean a it don't mean a thing but the second thing is the second half of this game to quote the david coleman thing is we need to change the mindsets in the institutions that are stopping us making our lives you know more kindly we need to be able to tap into health and local authorities and the prison service and the housing association and you name it the people who control the big decisions in our lives who themselves are not waking up in the morning to put people down, but who have got no idea how they can break out of the system and just start to do the right thing. So the second half of this is to say, what conversations can we have and with whom? And where is the low hanging fruit? And who is ready for change? Because they don't know how to cope with climate change. They don't know how to create a sustainable healthcare system. They've got another foggiest idea what to do with their public realm. Um, We're having conversations and there's another experiment going on. And um, that experiment um, is based around yeah, oh, thank you. It's based around two things. One, we have been invited into a lot of root, I was going to say corridors, inappropriate, in rooms in, in the NHS to start to talk about how food, nutrition, activity on the ground, people creating their own healthy futures is absolutely fundamental to serving a health service, not an illness service. And there is a significant shift in the mindset in some people in health who want to get behind this grassroots movement now. These people that actually are the policymakers want to support what we're doing and get out there on the cultural shift and help us shift the mindset about how we measure what good looks like. Because the other problem with this whole thing is if you keep using those old metrics, you'll set that old system. So we need to change the way that we are evaluating things. And I have to say, guys, the private sector is way ahead of the public sector in these areas. The second thing to do is we are pushing for a community right to community land. That is to say, we need to repurpose public realm. This is not because, as with propaganda gardens, once we've done this, suddenly everybody gets fed and we've cracked sustainable food supply. Of course not. But what we've got is a heck of a lot of public realm that we should have control over and we should have a right to say what goes on in it when it comes to food. And that would then produce the outcomes around not only more healthy, more healthy, confident, connected communities, but better soil quality because who wants to poison their kids? and more biodiversity because we all see the benefits of reconnecting with nature and all the other things that follow from that. A community right to community land. And we are working, God willing, with two local authorities who will help us through public health and the mainstream, try that experiment of saying the citizens can do this. You, the institutions, the servant leaders need to do that. And together we can create a new governance structure around our public realm. And that is the first step because beyond public realm, we can start to build confidence about citizens working collectively and collaboratively around growing their food, processing their food and investing in their soils together around the place that they call home. That's me done. Um, uh, Evie just uh, said in the comments that described you as the most amazing whirlwind of exciting common sense. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Which is glorious. Common Thank sense, you. I take this as a great, great thing. Yes, Thank you. Absolutely. Wow. We've really served you all up a rich feast of delights here. So many different flavours to savour. Like any good feast, it'll benefit hugely from being digested. So before we invite your questions and reflections, we're going to put you into breakout rooms of three or four people to discuss what you've heard. Uh, so, yeah, welcome back. I hope your conversations were um, were delicious and uh, exquisite and nourishing. And uh, what we wanted to do is to invite you to suggest any questions that you would like to explore with our panelists. And uh, you could write those into the chat and Rich and the team will kind of crunch those and uh, bunch them together so that we can see what the themes that are coming through that are strongest. Uh, but in the meantime, so while you're putting your questions into the chat, I'd like to invite um, each of our guests to share any reflections they have on hearing the other three. So they've heard the, the, the other three who've presented. It'd be nice to hear some reflections 
uh, on what they've heard this evening. So maybe Dee, should we start with you? Would you have any reflections on what? Um, yeah, I think the... we're all aligned. So I know I've been heavily influenced by both Pam and Julie in sort of my work, but also have taken it beyond. But I think we're all on the same web wavelength in terms of localizing food production, um, shorter food chains, in terms of sort of, you know, seeing what we could do from the ground up and challenging sort of policy. And well, Tim and I are on the London Food Board where we constantly do that. And sort of for both, I think Julie and myself, we're going beyond that in terms of DEFRA, um, a people's food policy. And I'm also beginning or have been working in the international sphere um, in terms of the UN Food System Summit and that, that corporate takeover, that, that concentration of power that Tim is referring to, that's happening on an international scale. So for me, it is about solidarity and for all of us to be working together to really challenge this power. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Tim, any reflections that you would have on, on what you've heard and the conversations that we've had? Um, first, it would be helpful if I unmuted myself. Um, well, I could listen to it all night. Uh, it, it's fabulous. Um, and please don't think my very sober kicking us off was because I don't like this, because I don't think this is wonderful, because I think it's, I'm in denial that um, this has grown. Uh, it, for me, it was wonderful, particularly, I see D a lot on the Lundu board, but to hear Pam's latest and, uh, and Julie's update, you know, these are growing and it's fabulous. But I'm just acutely aware how the force, what I fondly call the forces of twilight are growing even faster. Mm. Um, I'm raising when I was listening to the other three, uh, and did you too at the beginning, Rob, I was thinking, um, why are we not asking for a new law? Um, when Pam was saying, you know, new community land rights, we need to have a new, I call a, a food resilience and security act. Now is a moment to actually this broad movement, Rob, to come together and just say, we want to act. We've been waiting for three years for the National Food Strategy in England to come out. Now, I, I know quite a lot what's going on there. Um, but, and it constantly is pushed to one side, constantly being delayed. It's now delayed again till July. They're doing lots of rethinking. The, the politics and the political room for manoeuvre is narrowing. Now is the time when I think people outside us need to come together and say, we want a new act, which is a different vision to just saying to big landowners, we're now going to pay you for ecosystems services. And a little bit of, you know, an ex student of mine is uh, the excellent Chloe Dunn uh, doing the Cytopia. You know, it's more than two acres we need, it's more than just a few hundred acres. This is talking about getting a grip of the British food system, getting a grip of the disconnect between the people, public health, the over-consuming, mal-consuming, unsustainable food system, which is sucking in water from water-starved areas of the world and mistreating our own bodies. We've got to have something that goes into law because my, my this is me, the academic, Unless we get things into law, there's slipping and sliding. You know, we changed the food system in the 19th century with two things. One, the campaign for unadulterated foods, and secondly, the co-op movement. In a sense, all of this that we've been talking about tonight, all these wonderful experiments, you know, they're more than experiments, but they're experiments, uh, uh, need to be consolidated. And for me, 
none of us are looking up enough saying, let us have in law something which expresses the public will and the public interest. So, you know, I, I, I know well, at least five people on this call well enough to be frank, and the rest I'm taking a risk. Um, <laughs> we've, got, we've got to raise our sights at the same time as doing the fabulous things we do. I'm a gardener, I'm active. Uh, you know, I believe in small the things that we're doing, you know, but it's bigger than that too. And how do we do that? How do we get that? And to me, it's alliance of alliances, Rob. You're very good at this. Uh, uh, but it, uh, as you can tell from my tone of voice, a bit of harden actually. We've got a ruthless, nasty, partially corrupt government uh, playing hooky with pub money, throwing money at their friends and getting away with it and getting popular election. While the food system is in disarray and it was before COVID and Brexit. Now I'm not saying if we were back in the European Union, everything would be wonderful. It wouldn't be. But right now we need a new English food resilience and security act. And I do, I do now I now am going to say, want to, I, 15,000 words spelling out what that needs to be in, uh, in uh, my book. We've got to have a new system of regional food governance. The conservatives, when they destroyed um, the thinking that was going on at the end of Labour, they didn't want to do it either, by the way. Uh, but the finance and commodity crisis 2007-8 forced them to do it. And they went through a rapid learning, actually, and it was very good. Uh, it wasn't nirvana, but it was really good compared to where we are now. In came the coalition in 2010, swept it all away. You go back, look at the Food 2030 document, almost everything that's been talked about tonight was in that, but, and signed off by the prime minister. You know, so we need to be thinking now, Rob, bigger, how can we get that bigger umbrella, if you like? And it's gotta be in law. If we don't get food laws, there's ducking in So that's my big thought. And that's to me. I'm not saying that to everyone else. That's me. Too. That's a challenge to me. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Uh, Pam, any reflections on what you've heard from everybody else here? Yeah. Um, well, I already said um, in the intro to my spiel, you know, what I thought was really stand out for me about Julian and Dee, about, you know, the investment deep into people to give them the, the, the power and the self-assertiveness to be able to argue their corner more often, more frequently. Um, and the, the critical, bringing together a critical mass around place, I'm a, a, you know, I'm a great believer that that really makes the point a lot more strongly than disparate things all over the place. So um, that, that weaving, that networking, that um, strengthening each other's role around place, I just think is incredibly important. For me, you know, I mean, the, the, the incredible edible thing was invented so that anybody could do any bit of it they wanted without worrying whether the whole thing stuck together because, you know, it would stick together. Um, and it seems to me that what we've heard tonight and, and what we know from the people that are in the room is there are zillions of brilliant things going on and they must continue to go on and they mustn't be made to feel as if they are inadequate in any way. You know, that they are in, in some way because they don't get this big sustainable and they're not able to, do, no, we are nothing if we don't have demonstrators. This is, life is all an experiment. And what we need to do is to collect those stories and nurture those stories and invest in those stories and invest in the governance around those stories. Because, because with, without the strength of the grassroots, we do not get the buy-in from the wider public. We do not get people understanding why this matters at all that this isn't an academic exercise from somebody who sat in Sweden. No, no, no. Th this is the reality of the, of the next 10, 20 years. And, and it is within our power to do something local, even though the actions are small. We need to keep telling that story and invest in it. And that's why I'm really keen on, on looking at governance structures, because the, the money that comes down from the lot, it's very tokenistic. 
You know, we need to find ways, and it cannot be beyond our cap, to find ways of investing credit union money and other monies in making sure that we are building that strength of the grassroots. Having said that, what also needs to happen is we, of course, we need to shift the dial on the frameworks. Of course, we need to be challenging those people who are stopping you know, us living better lives, whether that's about how they invest their money, it, whether that's uh, whether they control their land or, or whatever it might be. This sense of top down authority does not produce good results. And it seems to me that this, you're absolutely right, Tim, that this is the moment to be grabbed because the people sat in Whitehall, whether we like them or we don't like them, have no solutions for climate change, for, for, have no solution to stop riots on the streets, have no solutions for, for, for dealing with health and stopping our hospitals getting, um, you know, uh, overrun. And there are many people around many board tables that aren't in Whitehall that actually are ready for change if they could just be given the confidence that there are demonstrators out there that say, this can be done differently. And that was what I was trying to hint at. There are people without a shadow of a doubt in significant positions of health at a national level that are looking at this. I am not talking about politicians, but I'm talking about professionals. And they're the same in local government across the piece, the same in the prison service, the same in the houses. So instead of trying to climb up the most difficult face of the most difficult mountain, let's go, go for the, the, the early wins and work with the willing and the able who want to create that critical mass around us. I continue to say that metrics matter. It's a really boring thing. You say that I'm an economist, not an environmentalist, not that I give a toss about economics, but basically, you know, we need to measure the social value, the health value, the natural capital, these things matter. And the private sector is way ahead on that. The stuff that some of those companies are doing, we should be grabbing that. It's just that there's so many different alternative metrics. It's a book of trying to understand which ones would be best used. My ultimate point is we do need to change the rules. That's all there is to it. Because there, since time immemorial, there's been great ideas that people have had and they've gone, wow, 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 and then they've fizzled. Why? Because you didn't control the rules. So we absolutely need to change the rules. And I'm with Tim. We need to be very savvy we need to find the achilles heel and we need to direct the change in legislation towards that societal achilles heel so that we can all benefit from it because as an ex-politician no, my enemies enemy can be my friend if we're savvy enough and the people in this room are savvy enough so learning from the grassroots directing the messages and changing the rules and the law in this country is the only really certain way of getting it done but the beauty about keeping the grassroots going, is that you, you are not throwing babies in the bathwaters out because you continue generation upon generation to build that strength of citizen leadership. That's my thoughts. Thank you, Pam. Thank you so much. Um, there is so much also interesting conversation and ideas that are bubbling away on the chat here. And, uh, and I would really point you towards the losing control platform uh, after this to continue those conversations to, to, to start these things. I think that's what it's there for. And for the next three weeks, it's really going to be a home for all kinds of conversations. So do do make the most of that. Uh, Julie, lastly, any thoughts that you would have on what you've heard from from the other guests this evening? Um. Oh my God, I don't, you know, I did and then I veered one way and then I came back and then I, yeah, I, I mean, um, oh, blimey, what to say. It is a vast and complex area, isn't it, food? Well, everything is, saving the world is, it's vastly, vastly complicated. And um, Tim, it's quite, it's, uh, I don't know what the challenge is. I, it is a huge challenge and we do need laws. Actually, what we probably need is a totally new economy. But in the absence of that, um, we need lots and lots of laws and regulation that control the economy that we do have. I mean, in terms of being able to pick bits of bits of legislation off that we might be able to sort of focus in on. Um, and I think that a lot of that is about sort of leveling you know if we're looking at food and farming it's about leveling the playing field so that basically we can't go on just you know not not paying for destroying 
the environment and biodiversity and the, and the, and the climate. Um, so I think it's a, it's a combination, it's a combination of things. It is, it is vastly huge and that's kind of like, oh my God, how are we going to do this? But then on the other hand, I think, oh, fuck it, let's just carry on doing what we're doing. And then we work out, we're, we're going to work out as we go along how, we, how to do things. And I think that that's possibly because I've had these years of doing this thing and kind of poking around on the ground going, what is, and then learning stuff. And then, and then, you know, we do have, we do have this vision and it's fast and probably completely, well, I shouldn't say that. Is it achievable? Who knows what we can achieve? but we move we move along and we carry on and we learn stuff and then we try to feed things back into that vision and we try to feed things back and learn what we can what it is we do need to change it's not coordinated enough tim it definitely isn't you know i was saying that 20 you know but i don't know what the answer to how to coordinate it is i've come up with loads and loads of diagrams and of lots of different organizations i have something of a tier two organizations tier two you know I have, um I don't know what the answer to that is, but what I do know is that increasingly organizations that have been working on the ground are moving into the policy sphere and they are starting to try to learn, you know, use what they've learned on the ground to drive policy change. It is, which is exactly kind of where we are at the moment. And the thing that we're thinking about in terms of reviewing all of our, you know, what we're doing is it's the economy, stupid. You know, it's the hot, it's the economy. We're trying to think about in terms of, okay, so if we look at the low income bags and, and the fact that the food costs too much, the food that we provide costs quite a lot because we pay for quite a lot of stuff in that. It's like B was, you know, in terms of D saying about, uh, you know, the, the approach to try to get some people to pay more for, so that other people can access food at a cheaper price. You know, there's a real conundrum there in terms of the, how much food costs and how we change the economic levers to change that. So that's kind of what we're, we're, that's what we're increasingly kind of thinking about. What are the economic levers? So what could we do, you know, very practically on the ground, what could we try to get local authorities to do to make it cheaper, you know, make it more possible for peri-urban farmers to survive, for instance? How can they reduce their costs of the, the you know, charge them less for rent and think about, um, wages and, and and not try you know we've got a whole raft of policies that we're sort of playing around with I mean we're not going to be able to campaign on all these things we're going to have to pick you know there's only uh, there's only a certain amount of time but the idea of sorry the dog has just come in and is now rolling around in quite a distracting way behind me but that's that's a whole other matter stop it um uh she's very cute and she might jump up in a minute but um yeah I'll try and control her so yes it's it's big and it's vast and it's really 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 scary um but on the other hand it kind of isn't you know we're just going to get on doing our stuff and we'll work out what the links are i'm not saying we're going to carry on doing the little tiny things i'm saying we're going to work out what the what the links are and we're going to work out how to collaborate we'll we might not work out enough you know but we'll work out something and we'll end up somewhere <laughs> um uh, and i don't you know that the sort of master plan <laughs> the master plan idea is only it kind of uh, only gets you so far doesn't it I, i'm just recalling a uh one of the things i was going to exp exp talk about was when when i first set up growing communities and we sent out this email to people saying all these things we wanted to do which was from things like carpooling and tool sharing, as well as all the growing and the gardening. And then we set up growing communities and food turned out to be so vast and interesting that we carried on doing that rather than renewable energy projects. But I got, an, I, 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 and we sent this questionnaire to all the people who were doing, who were involved in the CSA scheme at that time and saying, would, would they be help us do that? What do they want to do? Would they help us run this organization? And uh, we got these, <laughs> we got this, uh, hugely positive response and that's why we set up you know we set up the steering group and I got one letter which I wish I had framed now because it was on paper because we did write and you need to have paper in those days and it's basically said well I you know I thought I was just getting organic vegetables I wasn't expecting a Stalinist must plan <laughs> I'm off <laughs> and um yeah 
I don't know why I'm saying that. I mean, obviously Stalinist master plans probably, well, they don't, well, they're certainly not desirable and they don't work, but having a vision and making steps, going, taking steps towards it and learning as you go and then feeding it back in. That's what we're going to do. That's what we've got. That's what we've got. Carry on doing it. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and I, I always, I, the thing I love with your food zones thing for me is, is that it sets a kind of a framework within which we can be creative. I always look at it and think it's the most amazing invitation to the imagination that I've seen. It's just wonderful. If I was 18 looking at that now, I would just be thinking, wow, we could do this, we could do this, we could do this. So, so we have about 20, 25 minutes for questions. Um, so if I could just invite that your answers are quite succinct so that we could get a few different questions in. And I'm going to take a little bit of a liberty to, to, to kind of merge a few of the questions that have come in and to ask whether, when you were talking, Julie, there about a master plan, about an overall strategy, to what degree does it, does it mean that we need to stop looking at food as just food over on its own? To what degree do we need a national food strategy that says it's about food and mental health and social justice and all of this stuff put in together and mental health and physical health and uh, cleaner air and all of this stuff. And if we create this kind of joined up strategy, is that more likely to be successful? Maybe Pam, we'll start with you because you already have done quite a lot of work looking at that, bringing all of those different things together. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, someone put in the chat, if I don't, you don't mind me just commenting on the Future Generations Act in Wales, I'd be really, interested to hear the frontline feedback on that because when that came in I thought shit that is just why the flipping heck you know it's every aspect in planning and of course it doesn't suit this government and therefore we haven't got it but I would be really quite interested in in any comments about that I do think you've got to connect it up and I do think you've got to put it in a context that's meaningful to people um that's not to say you don't have a food strategy with the whole point about what then, you know, the stuff that Tim was talking about. But if it's in divine isolation, it's kind of like down there. Whereas it's absolutely integral to the health of a nation. It's how we grow our food is absolutely integral to our biodiversity um, investments, absolutely integral to whether we have a living soil or we don't have a living soil, absolutely integral to, you know, its production and its distribution, how we get to net zero it's absolutely integral to all these things so you know if we don't actually and that's why i'm really keen about doing it around place because around place you can make all those connections real and you can say this is a microcosm of what we could all have this is how by rethinking and repurposing our land and investing in our natural capital we get the social capital the um local economic capital, the human, whatever else it might be. I am a big fan of making the connections and talking to people that we don't normally talk to because most of them don't want their kids to die. They don't want, you know, most of them do give a damn. And if we don't do it that way, if we, so, so, so the whole thing about Incredible Edible was when you walk down your street, police station here, college there, health center there, what you saw connecting all those areas was food. So that you started to rethink the purpose of land and you started to connect in conversation what you put in your body to how you felt in terms of well-being and health, what you put in, in your body and what jobs your kids could get and so on. You know, so for me, it's no one trick pony, but without a shadow of a doubt, if we just keep talking food to food people, we're just not going to get the traction out there that is going to give us that sea change that we all need desperately now. Thank you, Pam. Fantastic. Uh, Tim? Well, I think we're there, aren't we? Um, it's, I always look with almost everyone I work with, we really must work harder. Um, in other words, we're doing it. I, I agree with what Dee and Pam and Julie have said. It's, it's not that I think anyone very much thinks that we shouldn't be doing what we're doing. It's just the scale of change that's needed is very great. It shouldn't depress us. This doesn't depress me at all. Um, 
it's just the way things are. Um, I'm reading a biography of Keir Hardy at the moment and the beginnings of the Labour Party, believe it or not, I'm just interesting social history. But you go back to the beginning of the co-op movement, you know, you wouldn't have thought it would end up uh, as it did. Um, but you burst, you do burst into tears when you realise that accrual of land that occurred from the co-op movement was sold out to pay off the debt of a, of a banking crisis of mismanagement and that the Wellcome Trust bought it. Uh, many people in the co-op farms think it's better run now than it was under the co-op. In other words, the values got lost. That, I, I think, is really one of the important things we can be nervous about. We must not lose sight of the values weaving this messy sketty uh, of our alternative food movements, our, I would call it new food movements. Um, and second is, I've alluded to, I do think we can learn a lot from the past. History does not repeat itself, uh, but we can see how previous movements have tried the land resettlement movement, the huge rich movement in this area, uh, in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, uh, and England, uh, from which we can learn a lot. I'll say no more than that. And then thirdly, I do think it's very powerful what we're all saying. The joy of food, like Pam, what got me into food myself, was that it was people. It's um, it's what we're doing to the food system and, and, and have turned the food system in our names to us uh, that is harming ourselves. And if you know, I'm, a, I'm an academic, I can say, I can review the last 70 years by just saying a moment of optimism and rebuilding in 1923, Hot Springs Conference, how many people here will know that? In the middle, well, towards the last third of the war, Second World War, plan went on for three weeks from th among 33 countries who said we must change the food system after this war and when it gets resolved because it was a damn mess of star environmental degradation rampant big companies a lot of the things that we're now seeing today but accelerate saw That movement, the pain is that no one thinks of now, but there were hundreds of groups like operating in the 20s and 30s. Uh, differently, but doing it, campaigning, arguing, pushing, it's got to be different. And I, I just finally, I, I do think this is a moment of great change mm. and we have to seize it. We have to seize it. And sees it in, and this is very pompous language, and we can come up with better, I'm sure, but it's a multi-level food problem. It's a multi-sector issue uh, and it's multi-agency. And we've got to capture that. So I don't want us to get rid of anything that we're doing, but there are some bits where we're weak actually, and we're weaker on looking up. I think the powerful tonight, Rob, is, and I affected this, is that the focus here is on the local and the place, but the place is also bigger. I, you know, I have a sense of place, but my identity is very patchy. I'm partly Welsh, I'm partly English. I've lived, I'm from the Midlands, lived most in the North, I farmed in the North, but I came to London for a year and I've been here nearly 35 years. But I still farm and garden what I can. Uh, you know, that's typ I'm typical in that sense. Mm, uh, yeah. we, we've, we've got lots we can, uh, uh, I do think we have to have alliance services. It's, you know, in July, the English government is going to present a new way forward. Sorry, the advisor to the British government is going to be, and already there are bits of government keep pushing it back. We have to, whatever we think of this, say something new is needed now. It is unacceptable. 
that deaths in the COVID crisis are associated with obesity. And Britain eats the most ultra processed diet of the whole of Europe. It is not surprising, even over and above the candid management of COVID and the her heroism of NHS and the brilliance of vaccination. This ain't going to get resolved unless we sort out food systems as well. Mm, and the government doesn't want that to happen. Wants to just ride to the sunset of deregulation and becoming the 51st state of the US or whatever it wants, recreate the British Empire when there isn't one, whatever its fantasies are. Uh, we, we've actually got the chance, I think, to do something in aim of because people get food. They get they don't get this tonight's been talking about it they don't get that it's test world thank you tim thank you tim d what's what's your thoughts around this sort of joined up a more joined up approach um so a people's food policy was just that it was you know a bottom-up grassroots approach to developing sort of food policy that was integrated. And I think that is where even the national food strategy is failing because I know with the obesity part, you know, that national food strategy did something and then another department was working on food strategy. So I think we have a big battle getting different parts of our government to talk to each other, much less actually work, to, work together to produce something that will be effective. And, you know, Tim is right. We need legislation. A strategy means nothing. It means they could push, push that aside. We need to be in those policy spaces. We need to be placing pressure on that advisory, on, on people in DEFRA and wherever else to say, this is what we want. This is what we want as people. Um, you know, we're supposed to be a democracy, but where is it? Who really has power in this country? As far as I see it, it is the food corporations. They are the ones who have power and I am reclaiming my power. Likewise, I want that knee off my neck, right? because we have a global food system, a British food system that is still colonial and um, imperialistic. I want knee off my neck. I, and I am, as, as my friend Claire Rotten on says, yeah, I am daring to stand in shadows of, of my ancestors and cultivate land of their oppressors. I, and I don't just want to cultivate land. I, I want to be part of this society and accept it as, as e more than equal, right? We're talking about equity, not equality, you know, to be considered human, right? Because black people are not considered human. Black people, black and Asian people right now are the people who are most impacted by food insecurity in, in this country. And there's an invisibility. There's, there's a blind eye towards it, right? And it's just myself and Kemi and a few other people, right, talking about it. And this is something I'm really passionate about, right? We need to wake up. We, this food system is not fit for purpose. It's not even broken. It is not fit for purpose. As long as we are oppressing people, as long as we are still looking to grow food elsewhere, to be the majority of the food we need here, it is not right. And we need to change that. We need to change that mindset. Food, food, you know, runs through every part of our life. Food is what binds us together. Food is what, you know, increase, yeah, is what makes our that and our identity. All right? Food is for me, the basis of sort of community building. And Tim spoke about values. People can't corrupt our values. So for me, food is about love and a joy and a alignment and manifestation of what we're visioning. We have to have a vision. 
that we hold on to, or else we can't do this work. Yeah, and that vision is of everyone being able to eat of a food system that respects the earth, right? Of people having their health so sovereignty. Yeah, I think, I think I'll, I'll leave it there because there's so much, but we can only do it together. I, we cannot expect one or two people to, to do it. And we need to be in those policy spaces. Thank you, Dee. And thank you for, for naming <laughs> systemic racism and exclusion into the, onto the table in the, in the heart of this conversation. Thank you. Um, Julie, your thoughts? Um, my thoughts are that um food as i mean as as the others have said and as d was just saying food food is is very you know it's incredibly fundamental place to start you know actually if, if we manage to sort out how to deal with you know how to how to produce how to have a sustainable and equitable and fair food system then we would pretty much i think we would manage to sort everything most other things out alongside that so we absolutely do need to, you know, yeah, we do need to make those connections. In fact, food does make those connections by, by its very nature, it makes the connections. It makes the connections between energy and transport and, and trading and uh, consumerism and is the customer always right? I mean, you know, um, uh, and should we actually be eating what we can produce rather than um, demanding what we want at any time of the at any time of the year from wherever we want it? Um, so uh, at, at the moment we're in a situation. I wasn't actually even going to go down that route. I don't know quite how I've ended here, but there you are. Um, we're in a situation where we have to voluntarily do all of that. You know, we have to have in you know in people that get this and choose to do things in a different way. Um, it would be so much easier with a Stalinist master plan, but in the absence of that, what we need is some regulation and some laws. And so, so these are not mutually exclusive, you know, they're not, they're not opposing things. What we're talking about is, um, and I agree with Dee, we need, you know, we so need to have more people in those policy circles, but my God, Dee, it's so hard to be in there, isn't it? You know, I mean, it must be, I don't know how, how hard it is for you as a black woman, it, I find it very difficult to be in those, oh, I'm sort of shuddering at the thought of it, you know, in terms of, you know, the, it's hard, it's hard being in rooms with people whose paradigms are, you know, worldviews are so far, you know, it's hard to find ways to get in to have, to even begin to talk about some of the, the issues around, you know, the, the, the way things run. Um, so, you know, I mean, I sit there next to, you know, the, the, vice president of the um, National Farmers Union. And it's kind of, I'm just trying to find, how, how can I begin to get into this? You know, when, when what we're doing is so tiny, I know, tiny in the grand scheme of things. But the point is that if all those tiny things were added, and they're not that tiny, actually, I must stop saying tiny, it is not tiny. So, you add up all those things and we end up with something that, you know, oh, it works. And actually it turns out to be as economically big or whatever terms people want to use, it produces as much food. We don't have the data to be able to, we don't have the evidence to be able to show that. We don't have the mechanisms to be able to compile all of that together at the moment. And that's sort of what the Better Food Traders is trying, you know, that's part of what it's trying to do. So the other thing that's going on is that, over, you know, over the last however many years we're talking about there are groups that are emerging on, on that sort of policy level and i'm just saying you know in terms of you know how sustain has grown tim over the years you know this lot you know in terms of this influence and its understanding um and um the the land workers alliance is another organization that's grown up over this last time i mean i i'm hoping that the better food traders will actually grow into being you know something that's going to be you know providing one of those platforms part of that alliance building and, and having more power to go into those policy spheres and actually go, well, you know, actually what we might be doing is 
actually it's not that tiny but it's small but if you add up all of this it is you cannot ignore this anymore and actually the lessons from this are that what we need is this this and this that's starting to happen it's starting to happen it's small but it's starting and we're it's more than starting it's moving um God, I quite exhausted myself then, that's it. I've, 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 we've moved, we've moved, we're moving, we'll keep moving, we'll keep carrying on, you know, I don't know, you know, I'm going to be dead quite, well, I'm not going to be dead as soon as Tim. <laughs> Maybe, but who knows, Tim? On that who, who bum shell. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's hard to tell on Zoom how, how you know, ages and things. So, um, but yeah, we'll just keep on going. Thank you, Judy. Fantastic. So, well, that one question seem has, has consumed all of our question time, uh, well, you know, and we could we could carry on all night. But I'm uh, at this point, I would like to just hand over to Fanny, who has been working, capturing all of the uh, ideas and conversation in a in, in, in a beautiful drawing, which she will now share with us as, as her capturing of this evening. Fanny, over to you. Hey, thank you, Rob. Uh, yes, maybe. Uh... You can allow me to share my screen. I will be very happy to, to do it. I think, Fanny, you're muted. I think it's just... Oh, no, I was, like, talking since since a little bit. Oh, well. Uh, so here, here you can see a bit of the process of the drawing I've been, I've been doing while we're having this amazing conversations and I'm not gonna talk too much. I'm just gonna let you have a look. Thank you so much. And I think I could have uh, keep going, painting uh, the floor and the, the walls of my, of my house, <laughs> listening to you. So big thanks to all of you. Fanny, that's fantastic. Thank you so, so much. So this beautiful thing, like, like, um, like the other ones that we have uh, created in these sessions will be available on the web tomorrow uh, and on our social media channels as well. So we are out of time for a Friday night and what with delight, fascinating session we just shared, I need to draw our conversation to a close. Thank you all so much. Mm -hmm.